Good morning. It's good to welcome you to St. Mark's today as we worship together on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's good to have you here. I want to welcome those of you who might be first time guests with us today. Uh, you get to experience the fall return of the St. Mark's Orchestra, and so it's good to have them back and under Ed Rao. And so we're grateful for you being here as we, uh, as we worship and celebrate. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we join our uh, call to worship, which is printed on the front of the bulletin, or you can follow along on the screen. God called Abraham and Sarah and promised to bless them. God called Isaac and Jacob as heirs of that promise. God calls us to join them and to be heirs with the faithful. So I'd like to invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, All Glory, Loud, and Honor. You can follow along on the screen or it's in the, the hymnal on page uh, number 280.
God of light and love, ignite our spirits to worship. Spirits worship sincerity. Illuminate our minds with the truth of your word. Inspire our hearts to seek only your treasure, that we might be moved to action and share your love. Through Jesus Christ, our hope and promise, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please take a moment to share a sign of peace with those around you. Again, I'd like to say a word of welcome, and uh, do want to invite you, if you are at the end of the row, if you would take those blue attendance pads and sign those, pass those down the row, so that we uh, have a record of you being here, and also there's a place there in case you have any uh, pastoral needs or prayer concerns that you'd like to share. You can also do that by going online to stmarscrumble.org slash attend. You can do that with your smartphone, and in both cases, there's a uh, place to mark uh, your attendance, but also uh, share any prayer needs that you have. If you open your bulletins this morning to the center section, there's a blue section in the middle. And as we are now sort of uh, initiating a lot of new fall programs, it's a great time if you've thought about being part of a small group study or a fellowship group, it's a good time to uh, really seriously consider that. And on the uh, blue section, the bottom, the left column at the very bottom, there's upcoming groups and studies. So there's a list there of studies. If you go in the entryway as you came in today, uh, there are tables on the left there that have copies of the books and sign-up sheets. And so uh, you can uh, consider how you might want to plug in and grow uh, this fall. We also, as uh, usual, have a number of missional activities going on. Right now, we'll be having a blood drive in a couple of weeks. Uh, we can, you can uh, bring in uh, personal items for youth for Outreach Indiana. We are playing a mission trip to Redbird Mission on November 6th to 8th. If you want more information about that, you can see uh, Stephanie Cohen, our missions coordinator, or uh, Robert Jennings, who will be helping lead that, that trip. These are all uh, opportunities that you have to plug in to be a part of life here at St. Mark's as we continue to aspire to make St. Mark's a place where mission is a way of life. At this time, uh, Dr. Eric DeForest is going to come and share a little bit about music ministry at St. Mark's and offer an invitation for you to be a part of the, the music ministries here. Good morning. Today we are going to shine a spotlight on the music ministry here at St. Mark's. This church is richly blessed with some incredibly talented and devoted musicians, allowing our music ministry to flourish. And I know that there are more of you out there. <laughs> and you're going to see in a minute a video that was created by Ryan Howe and Pam Whitehead. And it's, you're going to see all the opportunities there are here for you to participate in the music ministry. We have our wonderful orchestra here. Beautiful job this morning. Thank you. Um, there's the chancel choir, which is kicking off today from 1 to 3. Go grab some lunch and come back and sing with us. Um, we need some more handbell ringers in the handbell choir. There's the praise band uh, for the current service, if that is something that um, you are being called to do. And also, if you have little ones, there's the kids' music and praise. So lots of things to be involved in. And I want to invite you to search your hearts and see if you are being called to lend your talents to one of these musical groups here in our church and be part of our music ministry. Okay? Stop by the connections table outside, sign up for a group, or ask any questions. I'll be there. Pam will be there to answer your questions. So this is your formal invitation to come and join us and make a joyful noise. Ryan?
Oh Lord, I want to be in that number when the sun begins to shine. Good morning, St. Mark's. My name is Pam Whitehead, and I love music, and I welcome you to the beginning of the St. Mark's Orchestra season. St. Mark's is blessed to have so many gifted and dedicated musicians to share the gospel through their love of music. St. Mark's musicians, including the choir, bells, orchestra, and the organists and other instrumentalists, are truly lifelong learners who have chosen to join the music community because they just simply love music and the fellowship that music brings. My personal journey began at the age of six. My family was quite musical, and I began taking piano lessons from our church organist, who also was my neighbor. Mary Jane's fee for a piano lesson was 50 cents, and after eight years, the price never changed. I began singing in the church choir at around age 14, and I also played the piano for Sunday school. I have always been in some form of musical organization in school or church all my life. I have added a few instruments over the years just for fun and because I love a challenge and I just love music, plain and simple. Music is used to teach the gospel. God created us with the ability to sing and make music, and so we should. Lastly, I extend an invitation to any of you out there today who have ever had the slightest inkling to become part of the St. Mark's Music Fellowship. Just do it. Shake the dust off those instruments you have lurking in the back of your closets or hum a few familiar tunes and share your lovely voice with us. Just do it. God bless and have a musical day. God, you're always breaking through the dark, breaking into lives and healing hearts. Your love has torn the veil, your love can never fail. that you stand as you are able for the responsive reading of the Psalter, which is Psalm 112. You can find that on page 833 of the hymnal or follow along on the screens. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in God's commandments. Wealth and riches are in their house and their righteousness endures forever. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, trusting in the Lord. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor.
Tom, I'd like to invite us to a time of prayer. And as is our custom, we'll have a time of silent prayer in which you can offer our silent petitions to God, listen to God to speak into our hearts and souls. And then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer. So let us, uh, first of all, be in silent prayer together. Let us pray. Gracious God, you call us to relinquish the cares and concerns of our lives to you so that we might serve you in perfect freedom. Hear us as we bring before you the petitions of our hearts and minds. God of mercy, hear our prayers. We offer our prayers for the universal church. May our words and actions bring honor to your name and teach us true humility. We offer our prayers for the needs of the world. May peace pervade in all places of conflict and violence. We offer our prayers for those who suffer from sickness of mind, body, or spirit, and all those who care for them. We pray for those who have died who now worship in the presence of Christ and those who will die today and in the future. Almighty God, you call us to follow you with faithfulness, even when it challenges our relationships and the values of our culture. Help us to release our fears, nurture us in your ways, and sustain us as we seek your peace. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples and us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission focus for August is Operation Classroom. Operation Classroom helps young people in Liberia and Sierra Leone grow into educated and productive adults who can make a positive impact on our world, fighting the cycle of poverty. They have provided thousands of scholarships, allowing students who would otherwise be unable to attend school to get an education. You can learn more about the impact of their school and programs at stmarkscarmel.org slash missions. Financial donations may be made online at stmarkscarmel.org slash give or by using the mission offering envelope in your bulletin. Because you give, St. Mark's gives. Let us pray. Renewing and refreshing God, fill our thirsty souls with your living water. As Jesus promised to the woman at the well, and as Jeremiah reminded the prophets, this water is ours if we keep our focus on you and don't chase after other gods. May the offering we make this day Mark our commitment to keeping our eyes and our hearts set on a closer walk with you. We pray in the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
I'd like to invite you to remain standing as we hear together this morning's gospel lesson. The gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 14, one of the many uh, stories about Jesus as he is reclining at mealtime with uh, people. Oftentimes, Jesus kind of takes that as a moment to, uh, to reflect, to observe, to comment. So, from Luke chapter 14... On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. 
When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both you of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So how many of you have ever got that, gotten that phone call where someone on the other end calls you and they say, I want to invite you to a free weekend? <laughs> my, my funniest uh, experience with that is one time I, I, I got a call like that and they wanted to, the person on the line said, I'd like to invite you to a free weekend in Branson, Missouri. And they went on, and I said, I can save you a little time here. I'm really not a Branson, Missouri sort of person. You know, I mean, it's not my place. And she said, what's wrong with Branson, Missouri? I live in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> she went off on me. So I, I, I kind of listened for a few minutes, and then I just kind of... But... Um, you know, here's one of those situations where Jesus is at lunch. He's, he's been invited by a leader of the religious uh, group, the Pharisees, and it's on the Sabbath, so it's Sunday dinner equivalent uh, to us, as nearest we could make an equivalency. And so they are having their fancy sit-down dinner, and all of the local officials are invited because this is a community leader, and they are trying to line up in the best uh, positions to get close to Jesus, this, this local now becoming celebrity. And Jesus, as is often the case, is just paying attention to what's going on, just, just watching. And after a while of watching, he has something to say. Now, we have to back up just a moment and realize that the Gospel of Luke has, uh, describes Jesus at mealtime more than any of the other Gospels. So, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is, he's, he's often meeting with people over lunch or dinner or, you know, having conversations at mealtime. And some of the most important events in his life happened over mealtime, like the, the Last Supper, which is a, a meal that we commemorate uh, during the Lord's Supper. Uh, the, the meal that he had with those uh, people who were walking to Emmaus. Uh, the, the, the many different meals that he described as the, the wedding feast of God. The kind of, and they all represent kind of kingdom uh, the reign of God in, in a special way. And so when Jesus is at mealtime, there's always more going on than just a meal. There's always more happening, and oftentimes Jesus will use that moment to remind us of what it means to be invited into God's fellowship, because that's really what mealtime comes to represent for him is this invitation into the fellowship and the reign of God. So what, what should we learn from what Jesus has to say in this particular case? So he's sitting there and he's watching. And the tables in Jesus' time would be a little, they're not like the, the uh, you know, the, the British long table with a head, a person at the head, and, you know, I mean, which, which we might imagine. It was, they were in a three-sided table, and you would, they were close to the floor. You would literally sit on cushions and lean on the table. Uh, the person who was the guest of honor would be at the very center of this uh, three-sided uh, table, and, and people then would be uh, spread out from that position in order of importance. 
And so the, the most important guest would be at the, 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 side, the main table, and then the two side tables would, would just decrease in importance. And so Jesus would have been very much in the center, so he would have had a good view of everyone who came. And you have to suspect that somebody came in and maybe sat higher than their place. I mean, be, and, and was asked to move down, because that's kind of the comment, you know, the, the opportunity for comment that, that Jesus makes is, you know, I mean, if, if you are, you know, coming to a, a place of uh, uh, a wedding feast or something, don't sit too high. Let, let, them, let them invite you higher. Don't be presumptuous in that situation. As a matter of fact, the key element here is pride, which C.S. Lewis said is really the heart of all other sins is pride. It's thinking we are better than someone else. And I like that one, one commentator said that the problem with that situation is if, if you're sitting higher than you, than you ought to be, you are probably thinking that you deserve more than you're getting and that other people deserve less. So there is this comparative uh, sense of pride about it, which again, uh, C.S. Lewis says, pride really is essentially comparative. It's not that I have a lot, it's that I have more than you do or I'm better than you are or, you know, this comparative thing. So Jesus says, don't do that. In this society, in uh, the Middle Eastern culture of the time, we're, we're told that there was a, a cultural reality of honor and shame. And so you want to be honored, you want to, but you don't want to be shamed. You don't want to be put in positions where you have to be put in your place. And so Jesus is saying, you know, sit, sit toward the, the low end of the table and then be invited uh, to, to move up uh, the table. How many of you have ever uh, been at dinner or in a uh, meeting or conversation with someone that you, you left the meal or the, the party and you thought, that person really thinks a lot of themselves. When I was growing up, there was the, the idea of, uh, Garrison Keillor said this, this is quintessentially Midwestern idea, that don't think you're somebody, you know, don't think you're more than, than, than you are, and kind of entering in those situations with a sense of humility. It's kind of that concept what Jesus is uh, trying to get them. Now, the fact that it's mentioned that he was at a leading Pharisee's home kind of gives you a hint that there's probably not a lot of humility in the room in that situation. In the last paragraph of this scripture, Jesus even goes further. And so I'm going to ask you first, if you, if you give a, a dinner party to your house, if you invite people over for dinner, or maybe you meet people for dinner, how many of you invite total strangers to come have dinner with you in your house? Not very often, I would suspect. How many of you go down the street, and if someone is, is asking for money at the corner, you say, okay, why don't you have come dinner at my house? It's that kind of level of radical thinking that Jesus is proposing in this, in this story. If you imagine who is on the margins, who are the, the people that you think uh, you are least likely to invite to dinner, Jesus is saying, those are the people you need to be thinking about. Those are really the objects of this story and the people that need to be invited into God's kingdom. Jesus, in another place, tells a story about the, the wedding feast of, that, that's to represent the, the, uh, the incarnate, you know, the, the, the final setting of a uh, right of things by God. And in that story, uh, the people who are first invited are too busy to come. And so he says, just go out and gather people in. We can often make excuses about paying attention to God or paying attention to what uh, God calls us to do and to be or the people that God in, uh, asks us to invite. But Jesus says, look around you. Look at that person that uh, seems to be on the fringe who needs someone to care about them. And he says, invite them into the care and fellowship of God's feast. A few years ago, I was listening to NPR, and I heard an interview with Beverly Sills. Anybody 
remember Beverly Sills. She was a, an operatic singer with Metropolitan Opera for a number of years. But after she stopped singing, she became a really uh, huge fundraiser for the Met and did a lot of fundraising events. And she told the story um, on this radio interview about an event where they had invited some really big givers uh, to come and give money to the uh, Metropolitan Opera, and one person was invited to give a million dollars, quite the invitation. And so this person met with Beverly Sills, and he said, I'll tell you what, as part of the, the uh, uh, proposal with this, they would, they would give, and then they would also get seats to the opera for some operas. And so this guy said, I'll tell you what, I will give you a million dollars for the opera if I don't have to attend the opera. <laughs> but he said, if I have to attend the opera, you know, the ticket, I will, I will only give you $900,000. So Beverly Sills thought a moment, and she replied to him, she said, I tell you what, I will take you $900,000, and I want you to come hear the opera. So he came to a series of concerts, and months later, Beverly Sills was invited to his house, and at the dinner plates, they have different things, and at her dinner plate, they had name tags, so she knew where she was supposed to, to be uh, for dinner. And at her dinner plate, there was an envelope, and in the envelope, there was a check for $100,000. And so she had to ask. She, she talked to him after. She said, what's the check about? And he said, well... He said, you won me over. I, I love the opera now. And she said, well, that, in, in reflecting on it, she said when he first asked her about giving $100,000 or less if he didn't have to attend, or she said, you know, or giving the full amount if, if he didn't have to attend, she said, I'm not after his money. I want to win him over to opera because I'm not really asking for money. I'm asking for people to support the opera. And so I, th I think there's a lot about that in this story where Jesus is getting at the heart of things. And I think about that in the life of the church, you know. We're going to be entering into our stewardship emphasis in a, in a few weeks, and we're not asking you for money. We're asking you to support the mission of the church, to believe in what Jesus has done and is doing in people's lives. And so, as Jesus concludes this little vignette, he reminds us that there are invitations that each of us are meant to extend to other people. There are people who are outside of this great party that Jesus is enjoying and to which we have been invited and it is our role to invite others into this great feast. Those who are hungry, invite them to be fed. Those who are grieving, invite them into the resurrection hope. Those who are ill and infirmed, invite them into the healing presence of God. And so I want to challenge you. Who are the people in your lives that need to be invited into this great feast of which we are a part. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, you have called us to celebrate together, to hear the trumpets and the instruments, to be reminded of the joy of your presence in our lives. But we are not to just enjoy that ourselves, but to invite others, those who are on the margins, those who are left out, to invite them in, to give them the place of honor, and to celebrate together. In Christ's name, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, which is Be Thou My Vision. Let this be a reminder of Christ, not only the vision of Christ in our lives, but that to which he calls us as you continue singing through the stanzas. You'll come to terms with the fact that the vision of Christ in our lives calls us to be God's emissaries.
And now may we go from this time of worship. May we see Christ in those around us. May the vision of Christ's manifestation call us to invite and to celebrate. In the power of God's Holy Spirit, we go in peace. Amen.